Hey guys, so you may or may not know, I've been on the channel several times as an actor in different videos. Um, let me a mosquito on your arm. Just killed it right there. So a lot of you don't realize, but I am a truck driver for Yellow Freight. I've been an actor on a lot of these videos on this channel, and I enjoy acting, but not as much as I enjoy truck driving, right? So that's my passion. I'm a good actor, but I'm a great truck driver. So let me talk to you today about what's going on at Yellow Freight. The fence is energized. That's scary. Dude, you'd be killed if you tried to touch that fence. A couple weeks ago, we went to discuss new addendums to revising a contract under the National Master Freight Agreement. Now, our existing contract is going for another year but they wanted to change the operations. They wanted to implement this new one yellow plan. After the pandemic crisis was over and the idea of one yellow, it's a whole new spectrum. It's a whole new plan. It has nothing to do with really how the company was operated other than it is a LTL carrier. But they wanted to make sure that they had coverage within all networks. And they wanted to make sure that every employee was basically cross-trained for every single job. So hypothetically, a dock worker was a utility driver, a line hole driver was a dock worker. So operationally, it's great for them, but for the workers, it really wasn't desirable. That wasn't what we were signed up for originally, right? So there was some pushback from the union about implementing One Yellow. They were tardy on making a $50 million payment towards our essential state's health and welfare pension fund. They notified us that they weren't going to able to, they weren't going to be able to meet the obligations, and then we sent the rebuttal that we're going to strike. Um, we gave 72-hour notice as per contractual agreement that we're going to strike on this date if the payment's not made. The payment wasn't made. We never struck. What they did was they did a lockout, though. They said we're not making the payment. Not only that, but we're just going to shut the place down. So they locked us out. It's still up in the air is what's gonna happen yet. They still haven't formally filed. Today is August 1st. They haven't formally filed for bankruptcy. Seven, 11, or 13, none of which were filed. It's been a great company to work for for several years. I've been a truck driver here for uh, on and off since 2016. And I've worked in just about every trucking terminal in eastern side of Pennsylvania, basically all of the trucking terminals in New Jersey. I have been a bid driver on the night shift, city driver on the night shift, and I've been a shape driver on the morning shift. We've had a couple bumpy roads. Uh, the workers and management, it hasn't always been eye to eye. The last strike was in 94, but we haven't had a strike. From 94 to 2023, we've, you know, we've had a couple close calls with bankruptcy, but we dodged a bullet, right? So here we are in 2023, and having just been brought all this great work from the pandemic we're in the middle of a lockout so but we you know it's it there has been quite a few conflicts um between workers and management and it's not necessarily management's fault they're they're just following their procedures i would say corporate guidance if anything they need to be more directional right where they want the company headed so there was quite a bit of tension there with one yellow we spent an exuberant amount of money on the traveling clause within the National Master Freight Agreement to bring union organized labor to California and over in the West Coast to satisfy niche accounts that, you know, let's say maybe they were doing a promotion on something. I don't know all the details about what they were doing, but let's say someone's launching a brand promotion and they need 20 truck drivers. Well, Yellow can't use contracted freight. In other words, they can't use an outside owner operator. And they can't just hire 20 people off the street like this because it's very hard to find people who are in this sector. So we paid the traveling fare. And you can imagine the guys were making good money. Now, I don't know if it actually factored out to be profitable, but they were spending a lot of money in traveling labor. And I think that's what um, lowered the liquidity of our cash balance a lot. We were the rental car, the plane fare, the travel fees, the per diem, the hotel expenses. We were going through a lot, but we did need to have a better look at some of these accounts. Is this really profitable to pay someone's airfare back and forth 10 times to satisfy an account in California? I don't know, right? It was apparently what we needed to do to stay alive. 
If I was a CEO at Yellow Freight, I would have invested the $750 million and I would have invested it skillfully and I would have got interest on that. And then I would have come up with a new structured plan after the contracts was settled in 2024 when we're at a better negotiating time frame. They changed the one yellow implement before a contract, which was the first problem, and they implemented one yellow when the cash balance sheet was low. And it drained them more so with all the traveling fare. And guys were getting fatigued, and, and it was really, it was a lot of work to take on. So that was the two major corporate setbacks that we really set ourselves up for failure. That was where One Yellow failed. The CARES Act was part of the coronavirus relief package that the federal government issued certain companies, qualifying companies, based on their relevance, right? So based on how many people were on payroll, uh, the kind of work they performed and so forth. And uh, we originally applied for it as an essential defense contractor. We got around $750 million. We received the money and it was not well invested. We, I'm not sure where it all went. We're not, nobody's really sure. And I've worked there for years. The condition of the building, the overall terminals were still not in tip top shape. I, like I, I physically was shocked at the size of the potholes in the Philly terminal. I mean, the, the potholes, I mean, it would be halfway up your leg, it, an actual pothole. It was crazy what you factor in the budget and what you don't factor in the budget. And I, you know, I was adamant about this. I said, we got to get these potholes filled. This is crazy. Nobody cared. So, you know, when you start letting the roofs leak and the dock doors are falling in and, uh, the potholes are halfway up your leg. You have to ask yourself, what happened to the $750 million? We did make some bad investments over the years. Our CEOs um, in the early 2000s, they envisioned that they were gonna buy Roadway Express and its affiliates. And in 2003, they purchased Roadway and the acquisition of Roadway, we took on a lot of debt. And the idea of buying Roadway was to extend the network right so you wanted to you wanted to extend the network customer outreach better service better terminal uh, locations less lead time better freight tracking roadway my understanding roadway was a bigger company more drivers more mechanics more trucks bigger fleet we purchased it i believe it was like a 1.4 billion dollar deal in the early 2000s which is a pretty big chunk of change now the reason why we wanted to purchase roadway so bad was because their clerical system was incredible. Their bill processing streamlined everything that we do at Yellow Freight. The way they were able to print and process bills and the way they, the way they logged customer information, it was super high technology. Roadway was the highest technology trucking company of the early 2000s in its heyday and we couldn't beat them so we bought them and we could not beat their technology and we could not beat their lead times and their transit turnaround was incredible and so we took we took the loan out and we bought them that was the first uh bit of debt that we got into then a couple of years later we bought usf usf holland usf right away we bought all of their canadian affiliates right and so we took on even more debt so now it's you know 2005, 2006, the recession comes in 08, after we bought USF, business is going great. You know, uh, at that time in 2006, 2007, we had the most employees since the creation of the business we had. I think it was almost up to 40,000 employees um, at one point in time. So if you think about how many people are, like how many people does that represent, right? So that's like entire counties. Like if you just took a county and you counted everybody in like, you know, some town in Michigan or something, that's like the representation of an entire county. That's how many people were employed, right? Um, at that time it was YRC, right? Because when we purchased Roadway and we purchased USF, it was all YRC at that point, Yellow Roadway Corporation. Again, so the debt's stacking up, um, but we're doing great. We're paying off the debt, we're hiring drivers, people love their job, the health insurance is fantastic, negotiations, union, management, 
everything's going smooth. It's like clockwork. Every, every time it's due, it's renewed, negotiations are going well. Now, the crisis in 08, the recession in 08 hits. Trucking slowing down and we're having a hard time managing the debt. Now, that's when things got complicated. Now, we made some other small acquisitions. We bought a trucking company in New Jersey. We bought a, a couple other Canadian brands. We made some big acquisitions in Canada and it just did not fare well for um, the name long term. It, it, we, we could not maintain the debt to income ratio properly and the debt was stacking up unbelievably and we should have really been more careful about the amount of debt that we were bringing on ourselves and we should have done a self audit and realized that. That's where we, that's how where we are today. So we've been in operation um, since the recession in 08. We were in a boom cycle during the pandemic in 2020 and we were in an absolute boom. People were ordering online, uh, sight on scene. They didn't even think about it. They wanted everything delivered. Everything had to be delivered. Nobody wanted to go to the store. So a shipment of water bottles would be delivered LTL Yellow Freight. I mean, you know, if you had the money to pay for it, why not? You didn't want to expose yourself. You didn't want to go outside. And we were absolutely stacked. We didn't have enough drivers on the payroll to meet the demands in 2020. We didn't have enough physically. We physically didn't have enough trucks. We physically had more than what we could take on. We were making money hand over fist. There was no way you could ever tell me from 2020 to 2023 that this company would go bankrupt. It was just unfeasible. We were so busy, we were so backed up. Customers were calling off the hook. It was, the phone was ringing off the hook. As soon as you got back to the terminal, there's another run, there's another customer waiting. And that's how needed this service is, right? And the, the trucking bottlenecking that came out of it was, we were still able, I'm surprised, we we're still able to meet the obligations um, guaranteed deliveries were made on time. Work was handled quickly. Our dock operations um, were able to reinvent themselves to be able to handle more freight. We were busted. I mean, you couldn't even walk through the dock. That's how much freight we had. I mean, you're tripping over rows of, of freight. You couldn't get, you couldn't go anywhere. Uh, we were making money hand over fist. We were the premier carrier and we had all the best accounts. Every other LTL carrier was <laughs> because our volume was so big and our customer base dates back from a hundred years, uh, we were just, they were just always slightly behind our lead, right? We always, set the t we always set the tone, we set the pace. We had the best accounts, other carriers were playing catch up. They didn't have the drivers, we had all the drivers, we had experienced drivers, right? So when you talk about employee retention at Yellow Freight, people stay here for life. The guys are working here for the rest of their life, right? So we have guys, they've done the route, they know the truck, they're familiar with the trailer capacity, they know the freight handling procedure, they know how to deal with the bills. There is no, you know, there is really, no one can effectively compete with that. Um, someone who started, you know, a year ago working for a competitor, I'm not gonna say any names, but they just don't understand the business model like the drivers at Yellow Freight do. When you've done the job for 30 years, it shows. So I've learned a lot from them in experience. Be part of being a Teamster is you try and listen and you try and develop things from your colleagues, how to do th something a certain way. And I think that's you know, how I accumulated a lot of my trucking experience because I didn't come from a line of truck drivers. I came from the industry. I got experience from other guys I work with, right? So, and I think that's part of being a, being a union member. That's what it's about. A little bit about the company. So it was founded in the 1920s by two guys. I think they started with a model. They started originally with a Model T and it was a taxi company where they were taking people to and from. Eventually they diversified into deliveries. They founded the insignia of the checkered cab. So when you think about the yellow checkered cab, it's in every classic Americana, you know, music album cover, right? It is, a, a total American icon in street rods, hot rods. Everybody loves the checker cab. It's, it is originated from yellow freight. When you think about the color of yellow freight, right? It's not school bus yellow. It's not traffic cone orange. It's a very unique color. The branded logo of yellow was actually designed in the 1930s 
when a representative of Yellow Freight and an engineer from DuPont got together and they said that they want to create the most physically visible color possible. And the engineer from DuPont called uh, the Department of Transportation at the time and they did a study, uh, a very extensive study, um, trying to figure out the correct color that your eye could physically detect when traveling on a highway. And they came up with Yellow Freight. Yellow Freight founded the idea, they envisioned it, that all their equipment was gonna be painted that yellow, that specific color yellow. The color name is Swamp Holly Orange. That's the name of the color. If you wanted to paint your bathroom Yellow Freight yellow, it's called Swamp Holly Orange. So given the situation that Yellow Freight's in today, it's pretty hard to believe, right? Because this company, believe it or not, was a Fortune 500 company in the 90s and for the majority of the 90s. It was a very healthy company. This is before all the acquisitions. And we were listed in Forbes magazine, you know, above a lot of classic American monumental companies. I mean, like we were like listed like above like Kellogg's in the Fortune 500 magazine from like nine, 19... 92 through 95, I mean, Yellow Freight is a secure, bonded, guaranteed, bona fide company throughout the 90s. We had our own NASCAR team. We were a flourishing trucking company in the 90s. I mean, flourishing. All our sales staff had company cars. This is a, a pretty significant turnaround in a relatively short period of time. You know, location's key, right? When you're talking about you want to buy a house or you want to buy, you want a place you're going to park your boat or whatever it is, you want to put a cell tower somewhere, okay? You want to ensure that the location of the respected site is a good location, right? So now when you're talking about designing a trucking terminal, you need a good location. After 100 years in business, well, 99 years in business, Yellow Freight has accumulated the best locations. We have locations in Brooklyn, and we have locations in Monterey Bay, California. We have locations in Compton, California. We have locations in Los Angeles. Uh, we've got a multitude of loca locations in Chicago, Miami, all over the East Coast. These are prime real estate locations. You can't just redraw a community and put a trucking terminal in. It's existent and it's ours. Yellow Freight has some very, very fine real estate that's zoned industrial for a trucking company. That's not something you could just replicate. Coinciding with that, things that you can't just duplicate or replicate, our customer index profile dates back from 99 years. I mean, we, we have customers that have been with us from its, since inception. You know, a couple of the old roadway accounts, you know, like Goodyear Tires, we've had that account since the 20s. We've been holding Goodyear Tires since the 1920s. When you factor in the worth of a business, you just simply can't duplicate. You can't duplicate another terminal in South Plainfield. We have prime real estate in South Plainfield, New Jersey. We have a terminal on Hollywood Avenue. We have a terminal uh, in Karlstadt. We have a terminal in Kearney. We have a terminal in Kearney right underneath the Pulaski Skyway. Where are you gonna, how are you gonna make a trucking terminal in Kearney underneath the Pulaski Sky? There's only one. There's only one and it belongs to Yellow Freight. So when you talk about get, having the upper edge in the trucking industry, we're really favored. We have the, we have the finest real estate from Kearney, you can pull out of the driveway and you're on the New Jersey Turnpike or you make a right, you're in, uh, you're going through Bayonne. So when you talk about having the upper edge, having the customer profile, the index of, of real estate, we really have the upper hand. How does New Penn come into the picture? New Penn, New Penn stands for New Pennsylvania Motor Express. New Penn was purchased by Roadway and when Yellow purchased Roadway, in 2003, they also acquired New Penn through that deal. New Penn was another great acquisition between purchasing Roadway and purchasing New Penn. I mean, that was the deal of the century. New Penn and Roadway were like debt free companies, uh, very, very well ran, very efficient. New Penn basically built the infrastructure of Pennsylvania, and it simplified overnight deliveries from one end of Pennsylvania to the other. If you had something in Philadelphia, you had to get to Erie, guys were using new Pennsylvania Motor Express. That was how it started. It was coined. 
as the premier carrier of Pennsylvania, and it grew to be a regional dominating name. And people love New Penn. I mean, the customer base from origin from originally the 1920s until now. Uh, I mean, guys have stayed with New Penn for a hundred years, all through all essential service, all through World War II. Uh, I mean, you know, we were we were shipping bombs, we were shipping ammunition, we were shipping helmets, uniforms, food for the soldiers. We had it all in New Penn tractor trailers, and a lot of guys worked there. For many years, for many guys stayed with New Penn their whole lives. The pension was full, the benefits were incredible. If you lived in rural Pennsylvania, you wanted to work at New Penn. Men were waiting in line to get jobs at New Penn Motor Express. And it's true. Between the coal, the slate, the farms, guys went into trucking. I've had a few other trades jobs. I've worked for a plumbing company, I've been a diesel mechanic, and uh, I was a well water technician for many years. You know, the trades are pretty rough, right? But I will tell you this, YRC is very good, they were very good to their employees about being inclusive. You could be anybody you wanna be at YRC. It was a very, a very inclusive company to work for. We're LGBTQ friendly. We respect everyone's opinion. We respect everyone's, uh, you know, ideas in principle. Um, there's no exclusions to anyone and I do appreciate that about the company and I think it says a lot to the trucking industry. This is the first real trades experience that I've had where we really do hire minorities. We really do hire LGBTQ. We really do employ women. We seriously, I mean, you look at our payroll, a lot of our higher staff, a lot of our managers are women. And, you know, when you work for YRC and you work for, you know, Yellow Freight, it's a very inclusive company and they did treat you well. They treated their people very well. The health insurance, which is the number one reason why I work, I've always stayed with this company for such a long time. The health insurance is incredible. You cannot buy this policy out of pocket. You Trust me, you could not afford it. You could put yourself and your whole family on this plan at absolutely no cost, 100% paid. You'd have five kids, um, and your wife, it literally costs you nothing. So if you comp that policy, if you want to go buy it from the actual insurance broker, you want to buy it through the marketplace, I mean, several thousands of dollars. Several thousands of dollars. So if you factor in the supposed slightly lower wage rate that you're getting, if you work for a non-union trucking company and you compare it to our benefits, out of the question. I mean, it is absolutely a no-brainer to me and I'm very aware that a lot of American financial hardship is rooted from having inadequate insurance and getting medical services that you can't afford. So we've been able to, the company and the workers, we've been able to come up with a deal to format the best insurance plan possible, 100% company paid, and they take very good care of their employees when it comes to healthcare. And that I will tell you, um, Yellow Freight is excellent with. I have worked um, in several different terminals in the Northeast. I can only think of one person that got fired. And out of a thousand guys that I've met that work here, I think one guy got fired. Now, if you don't show up or you can't, you know, oblige to our contractual rules, like we have, we do have a policy for no call, no show. And that's just with any job. Yeah, you're, you're gonna get fired and the contractual five days, or whatever it comes down to. You don't call and you don't show up, sure, that's a termination. But let's say, for example, you know, I want, it's the summertime and I may not have, I might not have vacation time, you know, accumulated. A lot of corporations are like, oh, you know, you need vacation time to take a vacation. No, uh, well, I'm on the shape, which is casual. I'm a shape driver. I come in at eight o'clock in the morning. I just want to see what's available. If I'm, Deciding that I'm going to take a two-week vacation on Friday afternoon and I'm not going to come back for two weeks You just book off you just say <laughs> You just say I'll see you in two weeks. So there's no disciplinary action for that uh, Well, there hasn't been right yellow freight Takes very good care of their workers as far as um, the turnover if if you are fired it's a hundred percent because of something that you contractually broke 
a rule or something. You stole something, you, you, whatever. That I understand. So as far as, you know, termination, high turnover, people have existential life circumstances, right? People have issues, people have addictions, right? And it's all inclusive in our insurance that, you know, you can go to rehab, you can go to an AA meeting, you can go to a check-in, you can check into a facility. There is no disciplinary action for that at Yellow Freight. Um, it's a medical leave, right? It's a guaranteed medical leave. Nobody's gonna say anything to you. Now, if you work for Joe's Plumbing, I'm not sure how that's gonna work out if you tell your boss you're gonna go to rehab. Obviously, why people work at Yellow Freight, because the benefits are incredible and the termination policies are next to none. What we try and do is work together, try and work through different problems and circumstances that people have in their lives so that we can make it work. If you wanna stay as a truck driver, you can quickly and easily retire at, at Yellow Freight. And um, the pension is secure. It's backed by securities. It's backed by BlackRock. BlackRock is the number one holder in most pension programs. Um, every pension is through a different local. You have to consult with your own local about it, but if the company in, is insolvent, that doesn't mean your pension is insolvent with it. They're not making the desired contribution value. And yeah, the pensions are secure. They're not affiliated with the company at all. They just make an investment on your behalf. It's, it's monitored by professional accountants and they know who's retiring, when they're retiring, how much they're allotted per month, and you're briefed on all that. So it's not a surprise, it's not a guess. People have secure pensions, it's totally another department. Yellow Freight goes out of business today, people who've worked here for 35 years still have guaranteed pensions. So when you talk about the presence that Yellow Freight has in the American economy, it is huge. With our extensive network of over 300 terminals coast to co coast, to coast and internationally, right? We ship to Puerto Rico, we ship to Mexico, we've got logistics hubs in Canada. We have all kind of network extensively. YRC worldwide. You know, we had a global presence. So let's say for example, there's no concessions, we do not go back to work. And there's a vacuum now of truck drivers and dock workers. And there's, not, there's physically not enough people to handle the shipments that, that are now in void, right? There's a void now of labor and there's a void of equipment. And I don't know, I don't, I don't know how the economy is gonna shape up. People are saying that other carriers can quickly diversify and start bidding on freight, but we had so much freight. I mean, like I said, when you're talking about the, the, the one of the biggest trucking companies in America, do you really think that someone else is just gonna go in there and effectively bid on that? I mean, something has to give. They have to give something on on their end, an existing comp customer that, they, that they're currently working with in order to put new business first. So we have the biggest network. I mean, we have the biggest network in America. And should Yellow Freight go out of business indefinitely, well, you know, you're, you're gonna have a major supply shortage. You're gonna have, uh, they say we own around 10% of of trucking in the entire country. They're gonna have a very hard time figuring out how to get the product on the shelf or get the product to you, depending on what it is, if Yellow Freight's no longer in existence. And you're gonna have 30,000 workers that are out of a job. You know, sales, clerks, entry-level managers, dock workers, mid-level managers, all kind of, you know, different divisions of truck drivers. You've got city drivers, utility drivers, line haul drivers, road drivers, team drivers, okay, you got all those people. You've got dock workers, mechanics, out of the, all the union jobs, clerks, mostly union, uh, payroll specialists, payroll advisors, the legal team, customer support, customer care center. So it still hasn't worked itself out yet, but we, you just have to understand that the American consumer is ultimately gonna wind up paying for it. Now, I will tell you this, the only good thing that's gonna come out of it is we don't do controlled temperature. It's not gonna affect the food supply chain. I wouldn't worry about, you know, not being able to find milk or cheese or, you know, dairy products or like, you know, whatever, cereal. We, we do haul a lot of food, but 
It's for specific accounts, specific manufacturers, finished finished products from distribution centers going to retailers. That's the type of food we haul. Uh, we just don't want anybody having a panic attack. They're going to run out of food. That's not the case. But you're, you know, you're going to notice the price of a T-shirt's going to go up. The price of the shoes is going to go up. Gasoline might go up. Who knows? I don't know what's going to. I don't know how it's going to transpire. We just have to keep an eye on it, and um, we'll keep you informed. Yeah. So another thing that. I just thought it was a little odd about the implementation of the One Yellow was when One Yellow first, the inception of One Yellow, uh, the CEO also relocated the corporate headquarters from Overland Park, Kansas, which had been our headquarters for many years, to a very high-end place in Nashville, which, you know, I, I didn't necessarily think it was appropriate given the financial situation of the company. Still, um, you know, you want to be where your customers are based at and you want to be fluent with the community and you want to be part of Kansas. And I really do think that if this company is going to survive, it should be, it should be based out of Kansas. And we're really, we're welcome in Kansas. Kansas is home to us and um, the community for Yellow Freight is in Kansas. So here's my message to corporate leadership. If you want to save this company, let's cancel this high-end studio apartment in Nashville. The headquarters have to be back in Kansas, back in Overland Park, where we belong. We are a Kansas-based trucking company and cancel everything with one yellow. Let's get back to work. Let's start making money the old-fashioned way. We've been doing this for a hundred years. We know it best. Thank you for calling YRC Freight, a yellow company. If you know your party's four-digit extension, please enter it now. Manager, 